Half a day, good afternoon. Uh, today we are holding a roundtable hearing for our charter schools. So, um, the Committee on Education, Air Transportation, and Statistics Research and Planning and the General Government Operations, Appro Appropriations and Housing will now convene this informational hearing. The time is now 4.13 in the afternoon. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent out via to email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on March 12, 2019, and the second notice on March 15, 2019. I'd like to thank uh, Senator Moylan for being here today. Uh, the purpose of this informational briefing is to help the committee and the general public understand the nature of charter schools, how they are created, how they are funded, how they function, and what are some of the challenges that they may face. Today, today's hearing will focus on the process of filling charter positions, accreditation and assessment, and the impact of the charter school's budget. We want to ensure that our children are getting an adequate education, no matter what school they attend. We also want to ensure that these schools are accredited and equipped with teachers, certified and qualified personnel. As a chairperson of the Committee on Education, uh, we are dedicated as a body to improving the educational opportunities for our students of Guam. Okay, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, um, I think this is um, a, a very product, this will be a very productive round table just to understand what the charter schools do, especially as we near the appropriations um, in August. And so we want to ensure that the charter schools get the adequate funding that you need to operate and perhaps our movement forward. I understand that we have a, uh, another charter that has uh, been introduced here. And so we can also talk about that career tech who's all the way on the far side of the table over here. Um, so I believe there's also some presentations. So who would like to go first? Okay, let's go with the, the, the elder of the charter schools, and that's Guahan Academy Charter School. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Nelson and Senator Moreland. Oh, I just I want to apologize. Our chair is not feeling good. Remember, she got into an accident, and she was very painful today, so she went home to rest. So we're here on your request to have a roundtable discussion to discuss about charter schools. So I would yield to what are some of the concerns that you have. And on accreditation, I'm going to yield to Speaker Wampat, <laughs> Dr. Wampat. So we're going to go ahead and. I was, I was just wondering. At, well, thank you so much again for this uh, opportunity to be able to you know, bring all of us uh, to the table to talk about the charter schools. Uh, I know they've always been referring us as the uh, bastard yeah. child. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's even worse. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, but whatever it is. But, um, you know, I just always want to remind everybody that these are public school children. And <clears throat> we appreciate, of course, the, the items in which you would like to, to have us um, discuss. And, and I was wondering whether maybe to make it kind of easier for everybody at least, we can hear from everyone rather than one by one doing it and not, is that the, the process of filing the charter positions that everybody can answer, then accreditation and assessment, all of us can answer. And I'm saying that right because actually I'm waiting for Dr. Asablon to be here because she's our, in, our independent evaluator. And she has um, that information, which I really would love for her to share with you. And then, of course, the impact of the charter school's budget. So if you want to do C first, absolutely, well, we'll do that. Uh, and I'll go ahead and start, and then maybe uh, my brother here next door will, uh, the second child will chime in. But definitely not a redhead. Already. Definitely not. But um, as you... A little history, I suppose, is when it first actually had started. Uh, the legislature at that time had decided to appropriate 5500 per child. And um, 
As the, what year was that speaker? Uh, 2014, 13, 14, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 13. Then. 2013. And it was only then the year before this year, last year, uh, in which uh, former speaker uh, B.J. Cruz had raised it to 6,500. And because of the shortfall, then, and to make it equitable, I guess, around um, the board, is that he reduced it even further to 6,088. And th this is this school year that we're actually operating with uh, 6,088. The biggest impact, I would say, for all of us is that when the legislature had a given a, a cap, uh, then we basically, you know, in, uh, have budgeted with that cap for utilities, supplies, materials, uh, you know, salaries, and so forth. And when the budget was cut, then it definitely impacted uh, our budget in the sense that we still needed to maintain the dollar amount or the, the um, whatever the utilities are, the materials are, the teacher salaries in particular, because that for everyone is always the highest in personnel. But, and so to combat that, to make sure then that we're still living within the budget is that we really have to raise our, um, our classroom sizes uh, rather than hiring the additional teachers because we just didn't have the money for it. So that's usually the biggest uh, impact. But even further, others uh, will tell you, and in our testimony uh, last week on the budget, I made a long list of it, but one, one really big impact for us that we have to discontinue was the, to suspend rather is the 6% uh, contribution for the retirement plan. So that right now is on hold. It's, yes, it's uh, suspended. So that is not happening at all. And that's an equivalent to about over $100,000. And then because we know that the largest cost is always personnel then we had to release also two positions to be able again to live within our, our own budget. And lastly, because as I said before, is that in order to um, make good in terms of what it is that we're reducing, we need to start with ourselves. And so naturally the administrators, the four top administrators actually took a 10% cut. Uh is this still in effect? Yes. Okay. How, how many administrators were that took the 10% cut? This is your we, principals? Or? We, the, yes, <laughs> the dean, the executive director, our chief financial officer, and the chief academic officer. Okay. Thank you. If I may, what I will do is pass uh, to you the actual impact, impact our of our budget. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I know we talked a little bit about it at the budget hearing, but we actually did not provide you the value for each of the impact. The, the one other uh, <coughs> language which we provided also uh, last week to, uh, to all of you was where a cap then would be listed uh, in the budget and then whatever the dollar amount is per child. But there is this other language that would say that it's 6,500 per enrolled child, you know, or student in the school. And then because of the way DOE has been operating, uh, you know, that we usually, I, I still consider myself at that time as an educator, of course, I know that we were always uh, asked uh, on a daily basis for about a month to be able to take attendance every day of warm bodies, and then a cutoff number will be uh, usually by the end of September. So what DOE did is they applied that as well to the charter schools. And by doing so, aside from the, uh, the cut from 6,500 to 6,088, 
uh, they also reduced our budget accordingly based on the new number of September the 30th. 164. So, yes, so that was the so second. That's your, you're right. That's your reduction in 164,376. Yes. Okay. In September. That's, that's DOE that's reducing that. You're right. right. It's, so not, it's not DOE. DOE. But DOE. So DOE went. We have the money. Okay, so the legislature appropriated, appropriated you 6,000. Right. For 740 students. Okay, hold on. Use. In the beginning, your appropriation should be 6,500. But yes. because of the austere measures that were involved, we had yes. to reduce it to 6,088. So we had to cut education, yes. right? We had to sacrifice education. And so in addition to that, in law, we, we appropriated 6,088. But in addition to that, DOE went and did your own student count, 713 students. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then so they cut you by another 164,000. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that to see if uh, DOE has that kind of authority to, to deappropriate you the money that the legislature appropriates you. I, I, don't, I, I don't know if, if whoever made that decision had the authority to make that decision. Um, but uh, I think it's a literal, if I may, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I think they're looking at a literal translation because if you look at the budget law, it says per enrolled student. And okay. so when they say per enrolled student, we're thinking that if, we, if the council uh, allows us to go through the approved student population in our charter, and I can speak for GAC, so 740 is approved at the council level as the student population for that school year, we will be asking for that funding level for 740 because mm -hmm. that's our student population that we asked for in the beginning. So what happens is the literal translation is per student enrollment, but there's no deadline for that. So DOE comes in and says, on September 30th, charter mm -hmm. schools, please let me know what your student count is. And so administratively, we thought maybe they just want to know, so we give them names and we give them where they came from. So they would, um, because that data would be given to them, they would say, Johnny Boy's not here anymore at this school, and therefore that particular student transfers to charter school. On top of that information, they decided administratively, and I think uh, maybe because of the interpretation of that language and the budget law, the per-enrolled student, but there's no deadline, there's no saying, per enrolled student by September 30th. So that particular uh, deadline is an administrative ruling mm -hmm. on the part of DOE. And so I leave that up to the legislature okay. to uh, find out if the authority is there or not. Okay. I, you know, I'm sorry, I'd like to also thank uh, my co-chair of education, Senator Shelton, for being here. Thank you, Senator. Okay, so my question, I guess, and I'm sure a lot of our colleagues will have is, well, if you have 713 students, then rightfully so, you should be appropriated 713 and not the 740, because, you know, that's within operations. I think what we need to do is to prove that you need the allotment as you requested for 740 students but it just doesn't make um, financial sense. Just like a CIFA, CIFA has uh, um, less students, right? How, how many students does CIFA have now? Oh, We're here. oh sorry, CIFA, thank you. We have one, 101. And you're, you're appropriated for 350? 350, yes. So yes, yeah, so I guess the, the question boils down to is how do we justify giving you a full budget for the students that you're asking for when the warm bodies, um, you can't, you don't have that same enrollment rate. Yeah. So in GAC's, on GAC's case, is that seven, okay, so we have, say, four, uh, a family member coming in, and we're not able to, uh, they want to enroll their students. They're in the military, and so they, they've been saying, we want to go to Guahan Academy Charter School, so they're not in Guam, and they've not filled all the paperwork. And so the question is, 
And you're absolutely right. If we're going to budget for every child that's enrolled, um, that's that's a, a question that everybody should ask. Whether you know, should we pay for people who are not there? Um, we were not able to receive any more, even on our waiting list. And Dr. Wampat can attest to that. That we have over a hundred students in our waiting list. So you do have a wait list that will meet the 740. And how about you, Sifa? Do you? Um do you have a, a wait list? I, right now you have, I'm sorry, I didn't get no, the number. No, so we have 101. So 101. Yes, and our cap is at 350. Yes, so is there anything to prove that you can fill the 350 student enrollment? Uh, yes, the, well, we were continuing our pre-registration only because we are, we are starting, this is our first year, and so trying to get out the word on who we are and kind of proving who we are. Um, took some time in terms of uh, getting our students, but now we are actively in our pre-registration, so we, we do have a lot of interest coming in from iLearn Academy, as well as um, other, other public schools are coming to us. So yes, we believe we will fill that 350. For the next school year? For the next school year, yes. And then can, can I, yes, yeah, so I, I think, again, all, all due respect to our, my colleagues for GAC, so they obviously had a head start, right? Uh, unlike them, we, we started mid-year, you know, we actually started in January, and uh, we progressively had to enroll students, but I think the, I don't want to call it a flaw in the law, but the, the, the waiting game that we play with respect to our budget amounts and our approved enrollment amounts is we're now talking about our budget, but we won't know till August what the real amount is going to be, for and enrollment. whether, for enrollment, start with enrollment, and of course, uh, whether it was going to be 65 or 6088, okay? So we, we have to deal with that. But, you know, if, if we knew, for example, today that we can go to uh, 670 or 740 or 900 students, then we can start planning for that. You know, we can have an active enrollment period starting today all the way through July. When do you need a cutoff to, to basically say we can fill all these rooms go out and get the necessary teachers and staff to correspond to, to the amount that we need. So again, if, if we, we were able to get the approval, you know, I mean, basically the sense that we can go out there and actively recruit, we can get the 740 students. Mm. I think that's easily said. So I wrote my own little note here. I think historically what we got to go back is, is the 5,500 amount, which I really knew, <laughs> didn't know where that came from. Yeah, okay, so just, yeah, so. So again, and out of the good graces of uh, former Speaker Cruz, and I, I want to thank GDOE because they were the ones that said, well, you know, their, their true cost is 6,500. He said, well, thank you. Let's give them 6,500. But I, I thought that the amount we were talking about was, and I was quoted on the news, they, well, you know, it's 11,000, it's seven. I said, no, the, you know, whatever the amount is that we're going to compare um, the GDOE public school student versus the charter school public school students, um, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, but I think what we're asking is, why the cap? I don't, I don't hear of a cap for um, a Stumbo Middle, or I mean, a Stumbo Elementary or Machinau. They never say they have a cap. So what do you recommend? But just let them enroll. The, the, our capacity and our productivity, you know, we, we, when we applied for our charter, because that's the way it's structured, right? We, they asked us, how can you grow to the smart people to my right here, the true educators said, well, for the type of school we want to do, uh, 25 to 28 students, max enrollment should be this, and you know, okay. we defer to them. So we, we're chasing a 900 number, Senator, because that's our approved charter. Mm -hmm. uh, we should have been there two years ago. Okay? We would like to be there. Right now we're capped. six, yeah. yeah. And we, we couldn't, again, advertise for enrollment last year because we were waiting to find out what not only what our uh, number was going to be, yeah. but what is it, 65 or 6088? So, so what's the best way to, I guess you know what it is. Perhaps I'm thinking that the cap of enrollment is so that they know uh, a definitive number on Who how knows? much, perhaps the legislature, whoever is, you know, the I, uh, appropriations. So ask so, yourself this question, uh, Senator. How come we never asked GDOE that? No, I'm, I'm wondering yeah, the same thing. Yeah, I'm just, thing. you know, I, I, I've been there. Uh, I, said, understand. Yeah. It's a, I right. understand. I understand. And and I'm just saying, my my question is, okay, so how do we know how much to appropriate 
if we lift the cap? I, How do we do this? We can, we can safely say Do we just blindly here, give you a no? No, 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 no. You of course know? not. Of course yeah. not. So we, if you, we, if, can we if, justify 900, 740? Instead yes. of napkin math, you know, I, we need some kind of clear scientific approach to how do we appropriate you without limiting the cap? And, and I think that when we get that, I think that everyone, I, oh, I would definitely support. Are we okay with that? I mean, the there is a method to the madness that we yeah, do Yeah, that, that's what I'm okay? asking, yeah. So, <laughs> right. so, yeah, go ahead. Let the educators talk now. Yeah, I, I had kind of, I didn't share this with anybody, so this, I'm just gonna throw this out there and maybe we can think about it, but when I learned first started, our petition was for 358, but we started. I'm sorry, can you oh. just, you know, I, I forgot. Could everyone, when they grab the mic, just state your name for okay. the record? <laughs> I'm, I'm Helen Nishihira, iLearn Academy's Chief Operations Thank Officer. You. Thank you. So we started in January, in the middle of the year, um, and but our our budget was for 358. But we did not because we were in the middle of the year. We only received 130 um, students. six students, and mm -hmm. and for us that was a big surprise because we thought, wow, we got this really great product. We thought everybody would jump in, and that didn't happen. But when we first worked with DOA they gave us the understanding that the budget would be prorated. So if you have 138 students that month, that's the portion you're gonna get. So we worked throughout the semester that way, prorating 138. When June came in, we added all the pre-enrolled kids for the, the, um, for the next school year. Um, but when September came around, towards the tail end, we were informed by the internal auditor, by the way, you did not spend $700,000. And I'm not going, that cannot be correct because what they based the $700,000 was on the 358 for the entire fiscal year. Because we hit the 358, they said, oh yeah, this was how much you had. But they informed us that it was going to be prorated. So a lot of things were not very clear when we started. So when we started the next fiscal year, we ran with the cap as opposed to prorating. So if we didn't do the cap, maybe something like prorating every month. So if our enrollment is at 713 that month, then that's the prorated amount you get. Or if you hit the 900 and you're constantly hitting the 900, then you get the prorated amount for the 900 if there's a way to work something. I mean, just throwing it out there, you know. So uh, if, if, if I may. Because, one, one of the oh, issues is, and at name, DOE, name. Oh, Juan Flores, and I'm with the board at CTAX, CFAX. Um, one of the issues that, that DOE has to deal with every year is they have to project the number of teachers that they're going to need or the number of personnel they need at a school for any particular year. And one of the issues that we might address is for us to find a date, May 1st maybe, when all those, all students on Guam, all families on Guam who want to avail themselves of a publicly um, funded education will register. So we get 30,000 kids, 30,000 kids who get registered, and then there's a determination of how much money is going to be spent for each of, that, each of the children, right? So you get $30,000 and we decide, okay, $8,000 is going to be allotted to each child. And then as the enrollments come, so if iLearn decides they're going to try to enroll 900 kids, they, they go through whatever efforts it takes to enroll 900 children, and then they would get funded for those 900 children. Seriously? Now, if it means that there are 600 fewer students in, a DO, in, a G, in GDOE schools, then GDOE will get less funding for those 600 students because we keep hearing that there are 30,000 students in the, in the GDOE schools, and every time that number gets reduced because of the number of kids who go into charter schools, mm -hmm. That budget doesn't seem to be reduced in terms of the number of, of students. And I think it addresses two issues. It addresses planning, which I think GDOE and the charter schools need to do, but it also addresses equity. Mm -hmm. That the $8,000 or $5,000, whatever that number is, that Governor Guam can afford per student is equitably, equitably distributed to charter schools and GDOE schools, knowing that the GDOE schools have the benefit of economies of scale, right? Mm -hmm. So if you hired an accountant at iLearn, that, the cost of that accountant is spread only among, how many kids do you have now? 500 kids, whereas at GDOE, each accountant 
might be spread among, I don't know, depending on how many accounts they have, 5,000 kids. You see what I get in terms of economies of scale? They also have the benefit of federal funding, which the charter schools don't automatically get, like from the consolidated grant. They get some of it. And the charter schools do not benefit from the indirect costs that goes to GDOE for the implementation of the consolidated grant and the special ed funds. So uh, in terms of locally funded, if you can stand in front of your constituents and say, and I'm stealing from Francis Santos, if your child goes to GDOE school, we're going to allow them a certain amount of money. If your child chooses to go or you choose to send your child to a charter school, they're going to get the same amount of money because we think those kids should be treated equitably. Right. But, but it, it requires some planning. So it might mean that when GDOE finds out there are 600 fewer kids, they maximize enrollment, which we've all done. They decide if there are certain central office folks who won't be hired because they can't afford it, or they move staff around to make sure that the schools are properly staffed, which is exactly what charter schools. I mean, the charter schools have gone one step further, which they can't do. Wahan Academy reduced the salaries of certain administrators and maybe even increased class sizes, but the board union contract and civil service rules don't allow GDOE to do that. But there are other things they can do. Mm -hmm. to make sure that they, that they live within their means. And so Rosie you, Tanatonga and I, we can attest to having to do that. So are you, are you suggesting that we, um, we give a May 1st enrollment deadline and we lift the cap off of charter schools? I suggest a May 1st enrollment for any families that want to put their kids in a publicly funded for school DOE and, and charter, charter schools. School. And then the budget is determined. So if there's a pool of $340 million for public education that you d divide 340 by the number of children who will be enrolled in, the, in a publicly funded school and then parcel that out accordingly. Okay. That's my suggestion. Okay, I think I'll have to talk with DOE with this because perhaps we have to get their way in on, on how it will impact their operations and understand how they do enrollment as well. But um, no, I'm, I'm open to that. My, my concern just being the devil's advocate, no, is like, are you guys gonna enroll kids and you won't even be able to uh, hire the teachers or you don't have the facilities to support them? You know, are, are we going to go have this, are we going to have another, um, Perhaps, you know, another political pressure where we have, we're not funding charter schools and we're not, you know, and then DOE is getting cut. Just, just the division that it might cause is, 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 is a concern. But, no, I, I'm open, but I just want to, you know, have an assurance that, you know, the charter schools won't go and, hi you know, hire a bunch of teachers and grab all these students and don't have the facilities nor the resources to support yeah. that enrollment. Okay. The, I, I think, Senator, those are all great, great questions. And thank you, Juan, for the, for the suggestion. Um, I mean, having the history of sitting on, on the GDOE board, too, uh, and then, you know, I, I, had our, I had them pull out the budget requests. Um, honestly, the, the 14 points, that has to be totally revisited because it's, you know, I'm looking at one item. Um, a reliable supply of electricity is $14 million. Okay. That's, that's great, okay? But I can tell you right now that GPA is working with GDOE to find ways to lower their cost of electricity. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so again, the, the onus should be on them to, to come back and uh, here's a more glaring one. They need $106 million for a healthy, safe, sanitary learning environment, AKA the school. Okay, but they didn't tell me, the taxpayer, what the exact breakdown is for the 44 schools that we have. Now, I can tell you from our history that, and I applaud you, uh, Senator Nelson, that you, you want to go out to each of the individual schools. When you walk the campuses and you look and, you know, you, you, your, your eyes will open, and then you're going to say, that's not enough. But you're going to hear what the priorities are. So. Um, I, I agree, Juan. Let, let's 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 set a date when we know. I mean, 
We're chasing a number. Uh, we're chasing 900. They're chasing 740. CIFA wants 350, and, and so on and so forth. But nobody's holding them accountable with 30,000 students. I, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, you know, we, we've, I, for me personally and our group, we're, we're going into our fifth year. We're waiting for our charter to be renewed. And the future is looking good for, for the charter schools because the proof is in the pudding. We've come across and given a, a different way to educate our public school kids. So the choices out there, and thanks to the, the senators throughout the years, they've supported this. But I think, you know, I, I, it pains me to hear my good friend, um, Mark Mendiola and Superintendent Fernandez says, well, you keep on stealing money from us. Really? You know, don't, don't, don't put that on me or, or, or the, the thousand Actually, students. you're giving them got. a $5,000 bonus. Well I, well, I don't care what it is. <laughs> For every student okay? you the, take the, from them. If, if they want to call it a bonus, then for God's sake, come down here and tell me what did, you know, your GDOE student get for $5,000. I can tell you what an iLearn kid is going to get for $6,100. This device right here. Every one of our students has an iPad to learn from. Can GDOE say that? No. The question should be asked, why not? Why is this not the learning tool for every single student in the public school system? Why? Yes, I, I'm sure we all have our different techniques, and perhaps I, it's, it's, we, we can bring I, DOE to the table, well, and I we mean, can you know, the, discuss are, the differences yeah, I, I between the charter school and DOE, the but we don't want to belabor the issue. They're not here, here to defend I'm, themselves, and they do offer, I, you know, there's a lot of teachers and staff that I, been Worked there, really Senator, you know, that's why, I, I, like I said, I am excited for you guys to go out there yes. and, and sit in front of your, your and you should. Yes. It is a, a very interesting, thanks to Speaker Wampat, learning experience to go out there to every single school mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and sit there and hear the plight of the staff, the teachers, the PTA, and God willing, a student wants to come up and speak before you. Yes. So, so I, I, I embrace it. Yeah, we are working yeah. with some, several yeah. of our princi school principals yeah. to, to uh, accommodate us. Because that, that hasn't been done in God, many years. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was the last one to do it. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so I, that's one thing we'll look into is, is the May 1st enrollment deadline. Right. Uh, and, of course, we have to bring DOE to the table and discuss this further to see how, how they enroll and, and, and then... Uh, if we can move a, remove the cap of the charter school, granted that the charter school enrolls students in accordance with the resources that they have. Uh, like if, for example, if you have 10 classrooms and you have 40 students in each classroom, if we lift the cap off of enrollment, that's, that's not adequate, right? right? And so you, it, it must be adequate and fair and, and you may maintain your classroom sizes. So, Okay, I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion. We, right. we can look at the law and we can address that as well mm -hmm. to remove the cap. Okay, okay? good. That's good okay. news for us. So, yeah. uh, I, and I know we have a new charter, Career Tech. I, I just met uh, one of the members from Career Tech, I think, two weeks ago. And so, how, how did this happen? How did we get, and I think Senator Moylan introduced the bill to kind of support this Career Tech move. So, I just wanted to know, like, how did this come about? Uh, the, the, is anyone from the council here? Okay. <laughs> well, the, the way that I wrote the bill, of course, at the, at the time, because it was the very first, so we didn't know whether it was going to work or not until we've yes, been in operation. But uh, what it, the, the way I, because I wasn't getting full support from DOE because they thought that they'll be taking money out and when the child leaves, they'll mm -hmm. take the money from them, but that wasn't, it wasn't designed that way. We also, I created uh, several process. One is to start out a new charter school and there was a, a limit, so to speak, of how many elementary, middle and high schools and, but doesn't necessarily mean that that would remain uh, because it could you know, be amended as more and more people are interested in charter schools now and want to provide an alternative to the traditional 
uh, teaching that occurs at GDOE. The second would be a conversion that, and you know, DOE wanted a stronger number, a higher number to try to get teachers and parents and students uh, to agree to be chartered, you know, and of course, you know, you compromise on the floor with that number and that was a higher number. Although what I really wanted to do was to have conversion of schools, the charter schools, when they're failing, you know, academically failing, and where the management only to run a school will come in, but you can keep everybody, you keep the school, you keep the budget, you keep, you know, the teachers unless they want to move, and you get a new group to come in then and run that school, and that will be a converted school. So those are the two different uh, process. They have to go before the council, the uh, academy uh, charter council, who review then their proposal. They will submit their petition, and their proposal will include exactly what it is that they're going to be doing that's different. It has to be different from what DOE is currently offering. And so you saw then that at one time, yes, DI was off, uh, was the program to be offered at DOE. They no longer do it. So the academy charter school, Guahan Academy, wanted to do DI with fidelity. Then I learned they came around with then um, offering then to use technology, putting it in the hands of every child. And then CIFA wanted to do, of course, uh, more of the robotics, the science and emphasis, and STEM. So those are definitely three different uh, charter schools that you're seeing that you don't, nor, that DOE normally do not, you know, offer. So, so they go through the process, they provide all the information, and then the board members and the council, or the council members will decide then whether to give them a charter. And then once, you know, they do, then their budget would be put together and then submitted, um, you know, to the legislature. So that so there could be more. And as a matter of fact, there's you know there's a lot of people I have been hearing groups out there who would like to uh, start uh, different charter schools, like the group down here with you know Mr. Flores. And then I've heard of a Chamorro immersion program. I heard of an arts uh, academy that they want to do. So. But it's difficult right now with the current law that actually places a cap on how many then charter schools, how many schools can be chartered. Yes, Senator. But we still haven't met that cap on how many schools can be chartered, right? Correct. It's, okay. Yeah, it's, it's in the law that it not to exceed seven charter schools. And it did say that at least two shall be an elementary, one will be middle, and one will be high school, and no more than three non-converted public schools shall be authorized. Is uh, on page eight of the public law. Yeah. So. Elementary, the middle. Sorry, but yeah. we're removing the. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> But we proposed on the on the bill to remove the three. On the, the non-conversion. Yes. And that since was, and that? since the law has been passed, my understanding is there's never been a school community that is asked to convert a school from a D GDOE school to a charter school. I mean, the closest was when a couple, of a couple of senators suggested that Simon Sanchez be converted, but it didn't come from the school community. And uh, 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 Dr. Wampet, when she talked about if schools were, un were not performing, that's kind of a leftover from le No Child Left Behind, where in some states, schools were reconstituted, literally. So the management of those schools were changed. And I think in, in some charter schools, that's the spirit of why they did it. Um, we've had one example on Guam of a school community trying to run itself. And that was when Harmon Loop um, was a site-based school. I only had one year of experience there um, where the teachers told me what we were going to spend our money on. And the parents came in and they had input on who got hired or who didn't get hired. But that's the closest thing we've had to a school community in a, current, a currently existing uh, GDOE school having a say in how that school is gonna be run. And it's, I think it's a great idea, but if you go to any school and try to get 60% of the parents, 60% of the teachers, and there's some resistance 
to any teachers not being in charter schools because of different reasons. Um, and then if the students are over 18, 60 percent of those students agreeing to have that school convert to a charter school, that's a big challenge on Guam. And, and again, no school community that I know of has stepped forward to suggest that. And that's the reason why maybe a conversion of schools is not what we need um, on the island. And I have to, to beg to differ because there was one school actually, it was F.B. Leon Grail Middle School Your who school. piloted, my school, who piloted what we call the true middle school concept. And it was your grandmother and Dr. Ion Wolf that gave me authorization to do that. And we were able then to totally reform the school. And at the very end, an, an, uh, an evaluation was done to compare my school with all the other schools. And we exceeded every one of the school in terms of discipline, yes. attendance, self-esteem, uh, teacher morale, and reading test scores went up. The only reason we couldn't, of course, convert, it was only a pilot, it couldn't remain a pilot forever. And honestly, the law, I structured this law on F.B. Leon Guerrero Middle School program, designed it exactly that way. Conversion, because I wanted to convert F.B. at the time, and I had more than 60%, I had 100% of my teachers behind this program. They wanted to do it, but there was no law to make it happen. And that's why I never did. But you could look at this again and revisit even the number. I mean, Senator, what you're going to see, and later on you hear from our independent evaluator here, that you're, you're not going to see this. All of the charter schools take, of course, their role very seriously in making sure that not, we not only provide you know, a totally different program for the children, but that we actually will show student learning, actual student learning. And I'm not talking about accreditation per se, because that's a totally different animal. But it's are our children learning? And, I, and I, you would get that, I think, from every one of the charter schools. And that's exactly the way all schools uh, should be run that way, because we expect that of anyone who runs a school. Parents especially expect that you know, of our, our officials. Uh, if I may, so uh, Bill 57, what it does on the adjustment is basically no more, we eliminate the no more than three non-converted public schools shall be authorized. So it could be, but it, we just, the number is no longer the issue. If you want to convert, fine. If you don't, fine. So it's just giving that option is still there. Okay. Thank you. But you, but you need to also oh. lift that cap not to exceed oh. seven. That was my end. Why? Because then if you want, that's what I'm saying, if other schools want to, like I oh, said, there okay. are, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right, you can't leave it at seven then. You remove the, the non-converted, but then you don't, you don't do anything with the, the cap of seven. So we have to remove seven. Seven. You're right. Yes. If you're going to add more. Can Allow we're... for more. And everyone agrees with that? In the current law, there's a cap of seven. Uh, a cap of seven charter schools operating on Guam. Right. I'm not sure I understand why there is a cap. Um, okay. I, it, it seems like, um, I mean, we're all capitalists here. Um, <laughs> if in fact, I mean, we see it right now with the number of non-public schools that exist on the island, even when, when families go through, and I know a lot of them, go through really tough hardships because they choose to send their kids to a school that meets the needs of their kids and meets the needs of their families. So imagine if we're, we're always asking for families to have a greater say and a greater commitment to what goes on in school. Well, when they, I think when they get to choose that school, they're going to have that commitment. And, and that's something you can impress on them. So if, if in fact there were 20 charter schools and 20 fewer GDOE schools that maybe are using, the charter schools could use those facilities, if the, if the, if the bottom line is the students are learning and the bottom line is the students are successful, I'm not sure why we would shy away from that possibility. And so can you just, since we're talking about that, the 
because um, Career Tech has a conditional charter, no? Can you just explain to the public what is the conditional charter and how it is, how, how it is granted? Because Good. now we have to look to appropriate for Career Tech in the next Correct. fiscal year budget, no? So the, the Charter School Advisory Council um, had to choose between um, two schools to determine which was the third school. And the conditional, um, the conditional approval for, for Career Tech was given if the, if the law was changed, if the enabling legislation was changed, because they could not grant the charter if, in fact, the okay. law didn't allow for the fourth school. Which is the purpose of Senator Moreland's bill. That's correct. Bill. That's uh, Bill 5735. Okay. But, uh, speaker, that sounds like a great amendment. Maybe you want to talk to our fine senator here to introduce that. Maybe yes, she considers that. No, we, we should hear the uh, we should hear have a public hearing for that bill, and then we make the amendment on the floor. Yeah. Yes. He's getting my buy-in. That's, yeah. that's, that's a quick learner, huh? <laughs> um, okay. Um, and so I guess we already talked about the status of your enrollment of each charter school. Um, you know, I, 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 to, in truth, when, when I heard that charter schools were happening, speaker, and uh, I was a teacher, and uh, you were trying to get the, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, you were trying to acquire, was it FQ San Miguel down south to be a charter school? Actually, when, when the board um, were considering the mm -hmm. closure of Q and that they want the villagers wanted to keep it open, yes, then yeah. that's when I went to the village and I presented to them then the possibility that if they have chartered their school, then they can recruit children from other uh, villages and they yeah. would have increased their numbers because their capacity was about 100, I think 115, mm -hmm. and they were down to about 63 students. Yeah. And every child, when, you, when DOE did the cost, it was $17,000 per child uh, at that time. Yeah, and right, was, because of and the, the busing and the distance. Yeah, my, right. my No, grandma. it was because uh, take you, you take their budget, you're right, and they had individuals, uh, educators that were in the high end in their salary, oh, okay. and that's what brought, brought the numbers up. So, yeah, okay. So, so my grandmother was very upset that they closed down that school. I think she was very disappointed in the legislature at that time. The, and and no, I can speak to that. It wasn't the legislature closed it. It, it was, was the board. Oh, it was board. Um, Francis Santos. and <laughs> no, Was kidding. that you? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. Wow. I, um, yes, it was Francis Santos and... Rosie Tainatongo and no, Joseph Tainatongo did not agree yeah. to the All due respect. Um, no, we, we again, um, the hat that I wore during that time was the financial hat. And uh, clearly, from a, from a purely financial standpoint, with a student enrollment of 63 and a budget of, you know, the, uh, the wonderful part is when you're listening to the nurse, she loved her job. Right? And I said, I would too, if I only had 60 people to see, you know? And um, so again, that, that was a purely financial decision on the part of our board. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, all due respect to this current board, that issue has to be revisited because you have some schools whose enrollments don't fit the, the, the models anymore. You can't, you know, I mean, if, if you're running a school that, that's, that's made for 600 students and your facility is only housing 200 kids, the math will tell you that that's not working out right. Mm -hmm. you, you start, you, you need to do the shift right. as to where to put these so you better economize the, the, the limited funds that we're all dealing with. And I know it's not a popular thing to do because I, I mean, I have my life threatened because we were shutting down a school. But, you know, at the end of the day, it, it just didn't make economic sense. I, I, I mean, that's, that's the rationale behind that. And so, and so today, do you think it makes economic sense to open that school back up? No, because okay. you, you, you won't, you, the, the, the student enrollment will not be there. I mean, the population shift center that has already happened or continues to happen to this day is that there's just not enough students down there in, in the southern villages to support the school system. 
And, and even mm -hmm. when, they, when they closed the school, they transferred the children to mm -hmm. Maritza right. Elementary School, and today they're also under-enrolled with Melissa and Umatic students there. Okay. Senator, well, even... Thank you for that history. When I was at DOE, and even before there was a discussion about the school being closed, there were families who approached me because they felt that at that point, I think the, there were maybe 85 students in the school, and the families were very concerned that that was not a critical mass of students to incorporate programs in the school. Um, none of the charter schools are looking at, you know, uh, only having 50 or 60 students at their schools. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't afford to have certain things in the schools that make a school really healthy um, programmatically. And that was another concern. I understand why the board did it, because of financial reasons, but maybe the un, um, unheard parents um, from Umatic, if they were given a chance to talk, um, or if they knew they could survive, bring it up, they might have expressed some concerns about the number of students in those schools. And as Francis said, we have some schools that are getting close to that as well, um, that there, there isn't a critical mass of students to run a really effective program in the schools. So I, I, I understand that, I understand CIFA purpose, uh, CIFA purchased some property and then Gax, you're operating at, um, by in season rights in, in uh, by the DOE central building uh, no it's uh, actually owned by Cortec right. but because of all the other facilities uh, for Tijan High School and the building of uh, the DOE central building so you're operating right next then, to the so DOE central right building so we're right next to yeah. the police uh, state uh, department but it's on the lease is under, under the uh, governor's, governor's office okay office. and then i learn the, and We're in a temporary location now with the goal of trying to build a new campus. Okay, and then Career Tech? We're, leasing, we're going to lease facilities in Agate. I, I heard that the Nelson family was going to donate land for <laughs> our school. We're very happy about that. It's probably another Nelson family. Okay, I, I just want to make sure because I, I'm really thinking about this in the back of my mind. Um, to lift the enrollment. And so, you know, I know, I wanna ensure that you have the facilities to meet the enrollment you have. I, I know, Speaker, you said that GAX, you know, is looking to hopefully DOE will be giving up a, a, the E building. Um, and I'm just, I'm just concerned because we're giving so much money to DOE to sustain their facilities. Uh, we're also giving them a lot of money to, for the leases of the facilities. And so I'm just trying to, you know, connect all the dots, right? And understand how are you able to maintain your facilities at the limited cost you, you're you required to have, the 6,500. So um, I guess perhaps it's a rhetorical question, but it's just kind of puzzling to me that you're able to find the property that you need, the resources you need, the facilities you need within that small budget that you're allotted for. So I just want to make sure that this won't become an issue where you come back and say, well, we got this huge building and now we need you to fund this huge building and then DOE is going to be like, no, no, no. Uh, but but let, let's be all fair about this. Why don't you ask them that question? I mean, yeah, give us, give us 11,000 and, you know, there might be a Disneyland out there for all I know. I, I, again, it, not being facetious, I, I, you know, when, when, when we got this budget and we said, okay, we got to make it work, the, you know, the, the balance that we were tackling at ILEARN was you can't compromise the education, but at the same time, we need a facility that keeps our students safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's, I think that's every challenge for any school that's out there is that, that safe environment that you want your children to be in. But at the same time, I, I think our, our whole goal here is, is building a facility that, that's suitable for learning. So if we're managing to make it work, S Senator, with with our funding at this uh, level, imagine if you gave us, you know, thank you for the extra 428 bucks, we'll take that. But if there was really the issue of equity, parity, whatever it is, then you know, the proof again will be in the pudding where we will demonstrate what we're capable of doing with that level of funding 
And again, I, I don't like to use the word compare. I challenge my friends at GDOE here. What, again, you know, you, you have the luxury of, of the central staff, which we don't have, and all the other things that we read that, you know, that, that uh, your program has to do. Um, you know, we have to conserve electricity, we have to watch our water and, and so forth, but I think if you come back and just say, you know, if there's parity, there's equity, I, I mean, that would be fantabulous to get the same amount of money. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, and, and that's another thing, because, you know, DOE has been in the system for so long, right? And so they have the resources to manage their assets and their cash and so here we are separating charter schools out of the DOE budget. And you know, you're getting a separate appropriation. Okay, that's a better way to say it. There you go. Okay. Yeah. They will get a specific separate appropriation. Right. That's what we are working on. Um, and the resources, do you have the resources to manage that separate appropriation? Right. And the answer is yes. yes for the record. Yes. Okay. So that was Francis Santos, Senator Santos, Speaker Wampat. Yes. This is Tony Kong. Okay. Yes. Said yes for the record. Know. Okay. Because it's not, a, you didn't turn on your mic. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator, I, I, I think there, there may be two areas of accountability that you're pointed to, one of which is, is financial. And um, I think if the budgets are separate, I personally feel that the accountability for those budgets should be separate. And so there'd be an arm of DOA that might be doing what the internal auditors, auditors at DOE are doing. The reason I say that is because I don't think that DOE should decide whether an expenditure for a right. charter school is a valid one right. if it's the school's board that determines that that expenditure should be okay. used. So is, is, that, Senator, uh, is, that uh, arm, is that arm, has that already been discussed with DOE? DOA? Uh, it has, no, no, I haven't. With the council? And, but, um, Senator DeSantis has also mentioned that, uh, previously, recently, that there should be some account, some programmatic accountability for all of the charter schools. I don't know. I don't know that I think it should come from the DOE board because, again, there may be some issues there. But we have a we have a system set up already with the the charter school um, advisory council, yes. whose role could be in monitoring, if nothing else, an, an annual production of test scores to determine that the schools actually are meeting mm -hmm. the requirements to make sure that their budgets are being followed and and to ensure that in in some ways to ensure that the students are safe at the schools i think that could happen and then and there there won't be any conflict in the priorities of the charter schools versus the priorities of the gdoe schools right and so i, I that's part of the, that's the reason why I keep on asking the question, do you have the assets and the resources to support this? Because you also, in our budget hearing, you also had a list of proposed uh, legislations or amendments and add-ons to the law. And so we're making, I don't want to move the cart before the horse. And so I want to make sure that when we make this move, everything has already been uh, coordinated, uh, and is ready to go when we make the move, if and when we make the move. Yes, may I, uh, Madam yes, Chair? Senator. Uh, Guan Academy Charter School uh, actually approached DOA, not because we, we were approaching DOA ba uh, to solicit, um, it, I mean, to ask them to support us in being um, our, the entity to take place of DOE to do the 10-day um, reviewing, verifying of the invoices. But when I was approaching them, the, the budget law right now says that charter schools submit their invoices to DOA first. Yes. Now, why is that process there? Why did that budget law include a DOA? Because DOA was the, is the money agent. So DOA says, oh, well, okay, so you have an allotment request and you have a, a balance of two million your allotment request is for 50,000. Okay, it says, okay, they still have some money. It goes back to DOE, and then DOE has the 10 working day review. Now, we were told by DOA that there is a specific person there who's actually assigned, who's a, uh, an accountant who's assigned for charter schools. 
So that particular function is already there. It's been there because since the budget law was, was mandated, because it does tell the charter schools, this is what you do with your allotment request. It goes to DOA, and we don't transmit it to DOE. It's DOA that transmits it to DO, I mean DOA transmits it to DOE. And so the mechanism uh, this is, is, for your procurement. is in DOA, yes. I mean, so it's not going to create anything new for them because they have been in the process. But I also wanted to take this time to say that you're talking about facilities. There's one thing that I think Senator Moylan may look at an amendment to his bill or else maybe just a, uh, a, a new amendment, an amendment of the entire charter law. And I talked to the author. Right now, there is a provision there that says you cannot use public funds, okay? for a non-converted school. What do you think charter schools are for? Yeah. So how do we use that, how do we use local money to do anything for, mod, you for know, the facilities, right? for the yeah. facilities? But didn't a school do that already? Didn't one of the well, charters we, Yeah, but see, they, they came up with a, with a, uh, a was, it, a, who was, it, was it Iron? Okay, Iron. Iron did that. Yes, but what we did was we actually went through the process of um, seeking public money to renovate and to uh, get into the facility expansion, and they turned us down based on that. So how did how did how did Iron get the how did Iron get the? Can can you turn on your mic, Senator? I'm sorry, Senator. We're renting. And you guys, are you renting? No, you own. We have a, no. We have a we lease? have an MOU with oh, the governor's MOU. office okay. to use uh, building yep. C and D. Although we do have a piece of property in which we would like to go out yeah. now to build in our own campus, our own school. So okay, so they're two different. It's like apples and oranges. Then no, but the issue is sorry. The issue sure. is um, so they have a piece of property and within the. The allotted amount that's given to them, they wanted to use some of that to renovate. Right. And, but this is within the bu budget. They're not asking any more. Right. But that wasn't allowable because yeah, of that particular law. law. So if funds. I learn wanted to renovate one of the classrooms, we could not use the allotted money that's given to us to renovate because the law says we can't renovate, we can't construct, we can't right. remodel, we can't do anything. We'd have to use non appropriated funds to do that. And so if if the, only, if the majority of funding for charter schools comes from public funding, I'm not sure that that was probably intended. Uh, I think it may be, you know, that uh, I just don't understand the law that no public funds can be used, it can be used for non-converted schools for that kind of function when you, it's within the charter law, which is a new school. I mean, it's, it's a non-converted school. Okay. Okay, we'll look into that. And so the procurement process then, how do you go through your procurement process? So with so the procurement process, what we do is we procure according to what we think is uh, according to procurement law. And yes, okay. and because it applies to charter schools, then we send it over to GDOE and we believe that uh, based on two, one is a real legal opinion from the AG to uh, to I learned that they were not, they didn't have the authority to review their particular contract. And with us, it was an opinion, uh, it was a suggestion by the AG that uh, they don't have the authority to review procurement or that DOE extended its authority to review procurement for charter schools because charter schools are nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a that's a whole day debate. Uh, okay. But I believe that that's the way we do it. So here is an issue. So we go over and we say under the small procurement purchase, it's, um, we, you have up to 25,000 for services, professional services, because they just raised the, the, uh, the, the cap. So, so we decided to go through a RFQ based on the small purchase uh, procurement law, and they said, oh, you should have gone through an RFP. 
So how do they tell the board or the school that their preference in procurement when they're not the ones procuring? So if, we, when we, if and when we separate a different provision for charter schools for the budget, will you be able to procure within your council without going through DOE? Within the school, without DOE. But, but without DOE's oversight, your council would be the oversight? Yes. Okay. So that's all, that's, that's just what we need to do then is just put charter schools in their own budget category. And then that would fix that issue with your procurement. You still go through the normal government procurement law, but you wouldn't have to jump through all these hoops to get the resources that you need. Okay, all right. Okay, is there anything else? I think this has been pretty fast. Oh, assessment, yes, let's, 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 let's do assessment, yes. Because you, can I just say, I, I, I was always, um, I was always concerned that, uh, you know, what do these charter schools really do? What is their curriculum? Are they just sucking money from the government? <laughs> forgive me, okay, forgive me. This was, this was many years when you started out, and, you know, I was, I'm a, I, I was teaching at DOE, and I'm just like, man, these guys are, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make some money or, you know, and, and um, but no, I, I thank you, Speaker it's, Wanda, and, for know, the, right. and the great presentation you did at the budget hearing. We, we see it in the scores. Yes. And, and we see and, the emphasis on the every children. every one of the charter school has to put in a proposal, a curriculum, actually. Yeah, right. And you don't look jaded? Yeah. You guys no. look... Oh, no, we love yeah, it, yeah. as a matter of so fact. It's nice so, to see that. And that's where yeah. we're really very <laughs> proud to have our Dr. Sablan here, our okay. independent evaluator. So we're not just evaluating ourselves, we actually have an independent okay. evaluator, and i like for her to share. Okay, Dr. Sablan, can you just state your name and the, the work that you do? And oh, I have a written statement that I was gonna read to you, okay. um, and so why don't I just do that? Because I can jump in on these conversations easy, and it will be here all night. <laughs> so let me just give you some information, because I am the assessment uh, person with the numbers regarding how well our students are doing. So first of all, I want to say good uh, afternoon, Vice Speaker Talina Nelson and members of the Committee and of Education, Air Transportation Statistics Research and Planning. That's quite a mouthful. I'm Dr. Velma Sablan, a tenured full professor at the University of Guam and the independent evaluator for the Guahan Academy Charter School, GACS, since November 23rd, 2015 to the present. I'm writing this testimony to provide the requested information on GACS assessments, which your committee requested in your memorandum of March 12th, 2019. Uh, when you read this, there are some errors because our computers are old, they don't have color, <laughs> the traffic was bad, but we did the best we could in this, la this last minute. I've been the independent evaluator for GACS for four years and was first contracted to analyze test scores from 2014-2015 administration of both the district-wide assessment SAT-10 at the time, as well as the GACS alternative assessment that's given to students enrolled in GACS at the end of each academic year. I now have six major reports for GACS over these years and have followed every single student enrolled in GACS between 2014 to 2018. So I speak from a deeply knowledgeable perspective as I write this testimony regarding GACS assessment. For clarity, this testimony, uh, for this testimony, I'm providing histogram graphs to the committee so that you can look at it and we can interpret it and talk about it a little bit as we go along. I was recruited by the Charter School Council by then Chairperson Rosa Palomo when the GACS critically needed to have summary, uh, a summary of the performance of its enrolled students on the SAT-10 which both the charter schools and the GACS Board of Trustees needed for both reporting and instructional purposes. To be honest, and hold on to your chairs here, guys, I was a bit skeptical to do this work for GACS, as I am a UOG professor, and required ethically to report whatever emerged from this data, whether positive or negative. I was handed that first year a box with all the SAT-10 data for all the grades from 14-15. At the conclusion of all the data analyses and a 141-page report, 
GAC's 2014-2015 test results, SAT-10 results, were compared to GDOE's SAT-10 results from 2012 to 2013. The reason there was a discrepancy in terms of years is because GDOE stopped uh, providing public reports on their SAT-10 because they were making the transition to ACT Aspire and standards-based assessment. So, uh, so the, what was available and to the public was the, only the 2012-2013 results. The outcomes were significant, especially for the first to eighth grades. The graph that is on page two of this report is, this is testimony. Yes, I gave, they have one already. I, they have, but it's the extract. Yeah. So if you look at page two, the histogram shows the performance on SAT 10 from first to 11th grade. The left bar for each grade is GDOE's performance. The right bar is the GAC's performance in percentile ranks. So for first grade, the overall composite percentile rank was 26, 26 percentile. GAC's first graders were the 35th percentile composite. For second grade, they were at the 19th percentile rank in their composite scores. GAC's students at second grade were at the 36th percentile. In third grade, the percentile rank for GDOE composite was 16. GAC's third graders were at 36th percentile. At fourth grade, 21 percentile for GDOE, 32 for GAC's. Notice how GAC's uh, percentile scores are high until we get to the high school level. Fifth grade, they were at 18th percentile, GAC's at 27. Sixth grade, 21 for GDOE, 29 for GACs. Seventh grade, 23, 23rd percentile for DOE, GDOE, 27 for GACs. Eighth grade, now notice how now the progress is getting a little bit tighter between the two uh, entities here. So 25th percentile for the eighth graders, 27th percentile for GACs. The ninth grade, 29th percentile for GDOE, 34th percentile for GACs. 27, here's where now GAC students, and again, this was when GACs had just started doing high school. So 27th percent for GDOE, 24% for our 10th graders. And then by 11th grade, again, these are students who had not come through our system, the GAC school. 35th percentile for GDOE, 18th percentile for, for the uh, GACs. Now this is old data. This is the new data, and at this point, the 1718 report is still in process, but it will come out by the end of this month. However, I can report on the progress of the third graders. They're the first ones to get ACT Aspire, for example. So these are as recent as, as you can get it. This is the wide range achievement test that GAX uses within its own operation. This is what we selected to use to measure our students in their, and I'm gonna go down the left column on page three, word reading, their ability to read words. Sentence comprehension, their ability to understand what they're reading. Spelling, math computation, and reading composite, meaning we combine word reading and sentence comprehension, and we then look at that total score. And as you can see, the highest bars are at the 75th to 99th percentile. Our third graders are reading exceedingly high compared to other students in other schools, but I can't do a comparison because GDOE doesn't give the wide range achievement test at all. Uh, GAC students have shown 27 students at the 50th percentile, 32 between 75th and 99. In comprehension, in sentence comprehension, 19 were at the 50th to 74th percentile, 25 were at the 75th to 99th percentile, and so forth. So you can see the numbers. Look at math computation. There was nobody at the 50th, 74th, but 54 of our students in third grade were at the 75th to 99th percentile. Overall reading composite, 26 plus 24, we're looking at 50 students from fifth grade, or third grade rather, 
who are reading at the 50th percentile or above. I want to point out the national average is 50. All right? Our students are doing really well. But we do have, of course, those students that need more help who are at the 1st to 24th to the 25th percentile. The next graph shows the ACT Aspire, the same group of students. Now you see a change in the graph. Did you notice yeah. that there are more students now in ACT English Reading and Math who are at the first to the 24th percentile? And the teachers, when I went over this data with them, wanted to know why. And the reason why is that the ACT Aspire is aligned with the Common Core curriculum which was only recently adopted. GDO, uh, GACS does not uh, conform to that Common Core curriculum. We want to know, can our kids read? Can they write? Can they spell? And do they understand what they're reading? And the assessments that we're doing outside of ACT Aspire indicate that they are doing quite well. So this test is aligned to a curriculum that is supposed to be delivered uh, by the schools at each of the grade levels. We are not aligned. We are more concerned about literacy skills, computational skills, so that business, businesses and other career fields know that the kids that come out of our school know how to do these very, very basic skills. All right. So the ACT Aspire results, you notice how the numbers at the 50th and 70th, 5th percentile and higher are a little bit different on this test. Okay. On the next page, this is the GAC students. Uh, Dr. Borja Wampat asked me to include one of the class 10th uh, graders, and the earliest one I have are the 10th grade percentile ranks for 2016-2017 school year. Only 23 students are in this group that year, but again, if you look closely, a lot of the students are in the 50th to 99th percentile. Senator Zelina, we have good, smart kids on this island. They just need a very targeted, targeted curriculum that helps them develop those basic skills, especially during the early grades. So uh, GAC students are making significant progress. This full final assessment report will be made available to you, and it will be provided to the Charter Council as well. However, let me briefly point out a few of specifics on the report. Second grade, by the end of 1617 academic year, among the 95 students enrolled in second grade, 42% were demonstrating math computational skills between the third and fourth grade level. 44% could spell words between the third to ninth grade level. Direct instruction really develops the, the literacy skills of our students in the area of word reading and spelling in particular. Those guys, those students are really good spellers, especially if they've been rolled over time. Their reading compre comprehension skills were between third to sixth grade level for 34% of the second graders, with 42% demonstrating word reading skills between the third to the eighth grade. At third grade, of the 82 third graders, 67 were spelling words between the fourth to the ninth grade level, you have to understand, you know, I, I do this for a living. I went back over these numbers. I mean, did I make some mistake? Did I, did I make an error here? Cross-check the protocols. Everything was correct. Everything was correct. 61% were reading words uh, between fourth to the 10th grade level. 87% of third graders were demonstrating math computational skills at the third to fourth grade level. And reading comprehension, 72% between the third to the seventh grade level. The seventh graders, by the end of their seventh grade year that year, 15% of GAC students showed math computation skills up to the 10th and 12th grade level. 40% had spelling skills up to the tw uh, eighth to 11th grade. 40% showed word reading skills between 10th to 12th grade. And on the ACT Aspire test, 29% were at the national average with 12 of them exceeding the national average in English. In reading, 40% were at the national average with 10 students above the national average in that group. So GAX is using a well-structured 
a well-researched approach to teaching and learning, which is one of the reasons why I was excited to see these results, because direct, direct instruction has a long track record of success with students. And if, you're, if you want to look at some of that data on their research, I've provided four uh, sites where you can visit and take a look at those results. The school climate at the school at Gex is very positive. Despite all the public media and criticism of course facilities and you know, curtains dividing classrooms, limited space, these students come from a wide range of backgrounds at this school. And for example, on my way to meeting the Board of Trustees, I've observed on many occasions happy children. I've seen the, um, I've seen the Board of Trustees members taking, talking with students and school children, recognizing not only teachers and administrators, but all who work with the GACs. It is simply a pleasant place to be, to learn in an environment that is accepting of all ethnicities, of all language backgrounds, of different religious backgrounds, and in all levels of socioeconomic status. GAX has a very responsive and caring board of trustees. The members are exceedingly dedicated individuals. They meet often, as you can see also, GAX chooses the best. They meet often to solve problems and deal with insurmountable amount of pressure that is being uh, for the first charter school on Guam. And unlike any school on Guam, GAX seems always to be in the public eye. And they must deal with, the, with that camp that supports charter schools and the camp that doesn't. They must deal with both the critics and the supporters. But in my opinion, they sincerely believe they can lead to make a difference for children on Guam. This is their driving force. With this statement, I would like to publicly state that the GAX Board of Trustees will sorely miss Victor, Victor Paris, who has served on the board for over five years and passed away recently. And he will be very much missed because there was one man who really showed a lot of enthusiasm and believed in our kids. GAX understands that, un that assessment and instruction work together hand in hand. From the very beginning, GAX established a continued process of ongoing instruction and assessment and that has been a hallmark of their, their curriculum. The direct instruction, instruction approach requires continued monitoring of progress through daily assessments. The Board of Trustees has supported the dissemination of the assessment results for both district-wide and alternative assessments to monitor, monitor all the students enrolled. GAX recognizes students not only within the school, but to the local, excuse me, but to the local Guam community, and they know there is a lot of learning going on up there. And I really, really support the idea of segregating their budget out. Because Senator Nelson, if I gave you money to buy a wardrobe, and then I tell you what to buy and what size you're gonna buy, then I'm really not giving you anything at all, am I? And this is what all of the charter schools have been working with, so I think it would be very appropriate to do that. This is what we do with what little they have. Imagine what they could do if they had a great facility and they had more support in the schools. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sablon. Sablon. Thank you. Senator, may I, because yes, and I'm glad that she had mentioned this, when in the charter law, of course, it says that the, the charter school must then uh, perform competitively on all what any district-wide assessments are being offered at GDOE. Um, Dr. Sablan has just indicated that with the ACT Aspire, it is aligned with Common Core, and you'll find that every single one of us are not, uh, our, our, our curriculum is not aligned to Common Core, so whatever then results as required by law would, would never be able to uh, exceed those uh, numbers because we're not teaching the Common Core curriculum. So we might have to consider looking at that because I know Dr. Sablan in page five has actually recommended uh, other tests that we administer to our school children like the Bones test, the Dibbles, the RAT, and, and those are not being used at, at GDOE. <coughs> Our, our, our situation's a little bit different. We do use the ACT Aspire, but instead of 
our, our difficulty with the ACT Aspire is because we're a STEM school, we need a STEM assessment. And so we've asked GDOE to include the science under ACT and the writing because ACT Aspire actually have those components, but GDOE has not made the decision to purchase those components. So here we're taking a test, but it's incomplete, so we can't, we can't get our STEM scores that would validate what we do at our school. Um, we actually need to persuade GDOE to include the science and the writing component in the ACT Aspire. Yeah. So they, they do, yeah. They demonstrate, they, they give, there's, there's like five tests. You have the reading, the writing, the English, the math. Those were um, the ones that were offered. But we also asked them if they could do the science and the, uh, they don't do the writing, the science and the writing component so that when ACT Aspire gives us our score, they can actually create a STEM score using those, those tests. But because we're lacking um, some of the subtests, they can't give us a STEM score. So you have school like CIFA and like ourselves who are STEM schools, we won't be able to compile that unless we pay for it ourselves. In you our know, um, can I go ahead and touch bases? Hi, my name is uh, Mrs. Mantanonia, um, Interim Curriculum Coordinator for CIFA. Um, right now, we are at, um, we were not included in funding for the ACT Aspire. So we are relying on our own funds to purchase the test. And that is what, um, together with our administrators and our CEO and um, our founder, we have to evaluate what our school needs. And like she was saying, we're, we're, we're actually a STEAM-based school you know, based off of STEM and then integrating the arts. And it doesn't, those categories of testing, it doesn't highlight our curriculum. And as a charter school, um, you know, education is not one size fits all. And that's the reason why we're sitting here. Because um, each, each student and each school has a specific thing that we offer um, with I learn it's STEM, with us it's STEAM, and with DI. If a child doesn't learn or is not gaining what they, they need to at a public school, there's other alternative options. But we're not testing those options because we're very limited in resources. Uh, with us, unfortunately, we weren't included in the budget for the ACT Aspire. So for this year, we're going to go ahead and purchase the test on our own, but that's going to be another cost to the school. The ACT Aspire, actually, uh, yes, you. It's what DOE gives to all of their 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 Not students. All. Not all. Not. Right, yeah, but they, what I was going to say is the subject areas uh, they don't cover science and social studies. What we found out ourselves, as a matter of fact, this year under the consolidated grant is that it is not being paid uh, by the consolidated grant. So we all then have to be have to purchase it now. On is our there own. a reason why it's not being paid by the consolidated grant? Well, in the science social studies side, I know they've been asking for a couple of years, and it's never been included. With so us. just the fact that it wasn't included, or Do it was we, denied. No, it was just not included. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because, the, um, they, because GDOE does not. Actually, the way the way it works is so they have the ACT Aspire, which is purchased by the federal funds. Right. Right. But in the ACT Aspire, they only select certain components. What GDOE also utilizes is this test called SBA, yeah. and not all of us are sold on that test. So we chose not to do the SBA because it doesn't make any sense. If they could just take the science and the writing on and remove it from the SBA and put it in the ACT, then they can get the STEM scores that some schools, even their schools might want to have. But they want to stick to the SBA. SBA. So even though we're under the federal grant and we've asked for the science and the writing component, because GDOE as a whole only purchases these three subtests, the two are not ordered. Can you remove yourself from the federal grant and apply for your own grant? 
Is there something we, that prohibits you from doing could, that? We could, but uh, it would be a little bit more difficult for us doing it individually. The one great thing about the consolidated grant is that because USDOE is the state school agency for education and they get the one big grant, which yes. is actually good that they go out and they do this, they yes. do all the legwork for us, and yes. then they would apportion that according to our population right. and they say, okay, this is your dollar amount based on your population, what do you want? And as a matter of fact, they're actually setting up a workshop uh, next week to do just that. So every one of us has been given the forms to look at and include. And I was just sharing with yeah. Helen that what she should do then in that consolidated grant uh, request is to actually ask for And we have, though. The, the thing is, we've had for the past two years. The nice thing about taking, um, doing the ACT Aspire alongside with GDOE is you can get those comparisons. Our right. first year, we did it separately. Then we had to actually take their scores and try and consolidate them to compare. Right. So, Okay, well, I, 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 I just want another point. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we, uh, the independent evaluator has been required to study those students who continually enroll, all right? Mm -hmm. So we have cohorts that I've been studying mm -hmm. over time. So the kindergarten students that I started with are now in fourth grade, they'll be entering fifth. So how are they doing? That's what the 2017-18 report is gonna report. I hypothesize that they're gonna do quite well because they've been enrolled at GACs under direct instruction format since kinder. The problem that I have with GDOE's assessment is that kinder first and second are not included in ACT. So those are the critical learning years critical. And so we, before I even came on board, GAX was using the BOEM test of basic concepts, the Dibbles that assesses their ability to read, and then of course later on the RAT. But it, this is the kind of attention that GAX is paying to assessments. And again, what is the purpose of assessment? It should inform instruction. If all you're going to do is measure and not take that data and feed it back to teachers, it's pointless. It's like taking a diabetic test, but I'm not going to treat you. It makes no sense. So always the timing of the release of these test results have got to occur in a cycle where teachers get it, they know where the kids stand, and then they know how to group, how to format uh, the various curriculum programs that they have. Is there, has there been a reason why you have not, they have not included those specific areas in the consolidated grants? Is, will DOE lose out on something? Or, I'm, I'm not really sure because I've asked t twice. And um, I think this year they finally added the writing component. So that's there, but we still But you need the science. The, yeah, we still need the science. And, and I, Senator, the, the, when the AC, ACT Aspire tests were developed, they were developed to align with the Common Core State Standards. When the Common Core State Standards were initially developed, they were initially developed to test, I mean, to address literacy and numeracy, not to, do, not to address content learning. It was to, to, to look at how do we teach kids how to read, write, speak, listen, and then to be able to, to deal with math. So the focus has been in those areas. There are other standards. So there are some states that have now incorporated the National Council of Social Studies standards or the Next Generation Science standards and have separate assessments for those. I think the reason why we could still live with, even if it's only from third to 10th grade, there's still a common assessment that all the schools on Guam, and I agree that the schools, it, we shouldn't have a one size fits all for schools. We can have a one goal, goal fits all, and then we all figure out how to reach those goals. But, but if we separate those, if we make, you know, the DOE schools and the charter schools have different goals, it's very difficult to, to let parents know whether or not the schools are meeting the needs of the kids. But if there's a common assessment, I mean, if, if the, ACT Aspire scores from all the charter schools continue to show that the kids are doing better than the GDOE students, then we're in good shape. How we get to that point, how each school gets to the point, is up to each school. But there, there's a common assessment right now. That common assessment reflects, right now reflects, the, the uh, Common Core State Standards, which have been developed by, initially was developed by the Council of Chief State School Officers, and this, most states have, have signed on to them. Okay. All right. Anything else? 
We just need to convince DOE to start including these uh, provisions in the CGI. I, because they're going to be meeting, meeting <laughs> next week, I think there is this opportunity actually okay. to, to let them know what it is that we would need. Okay. Uh, like uh, GAX, we purchase all the other ones ourselves. Yes. And, and I think it's because it's not in their list of uh, assessments, similar to that if the textbooks we want to order are not a part of their textbook list, then we can't order those. Which is really, and that is something, again, you must address when you do the textbook, because although there is a, an adopted list of textbooks for GDOE, we are supposed to be to. able to have access to that as well, based not. on our population, but we can't, because, because we're not teaching the same right. things that they're teaching, so we lose out. We don't then take advantage of uh, the textbook uh, monies. Okay. We can have at the, the textbooks that we need from the charter school to be included in DOE's listing? I can just imagine Senator Essay saying, now you guys are asking for more than... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not... not, not act, no, Senator, I'm, I'm I not think that... we're act, asking think for more. I think solution. what it is... I'm sorry. Uh, may I, Is that w because we are all very different and we're not used... We don't have the same curriculum. We don't have the same right. adopted textbooks that then whatever the portion is that we're allowed, let's say I'm allowed $20,000, then allow me to buy with that 20,000, basically the DI books that I'm going to need. And not, not more, I'm just saying whatever is our portion. Okay. Textbooks is one area that's locally funded. So in fact, if that's part of how much it costs to fund a publicly funded education, as long as that's equitable, if DOE chooses certain textbooks, that's great. They have a process for selecting those schools. Each of the starter schools should go through their own process. Again, I think there should be a common goal, but each school has to be given a chance to determine how it's gonna reach that goal. And textbooks, or, or uh, I'm not gonna just say textbooks, I'm gonna say materials, because they could be digital, um, should be up to each school to determine that. But that, that, that's only a fair thing to say if, in fact, there's equitable funding for all kids. Okay. Okay. So I only heard GAC's assessment. Do you, does iLearn have an assessment? Sure. And, uh, and then SIFA, do you use? Okay. Do you use this? Okay. Hi, Senator. My name is Rachel Stake. I'm the principal at iLearn. Um, so when we opened in January of 2015, um, because it was halfway through the school year, we didn't participate in the ACT Aspire for that um, year. We did for the last three years, and we were able to compile um, data from the last three years. And what I can do, um, Senator One, invite you to our school and, and we would love to have you there, and we can go um, over anything you want to more in depth, but I can also provide your office with our assessment scores that we were able to compile over the last three years. But what I can say is that our students um, who have been tested from third through fifth grade have shown a significant increase every year that we have taken the test. Um, we do perform at about a two to five point range higher than DOE on all three years. Um, and we continue to do so. So what I've done is I have compared um, our third grade students who took the test and who promoted and were in fifth grade from last year just to see the students who have been with us for all of the years, or for all of those years. It is. Um, to see whether or not there have been an increase and there has, um, but overall, it's been good. Okay, yeah, you know, it would be good to have documentation yeah. to, to see, and so if we can get that documentation, and I'm just thinking if there's a, uh, maybe the council can create a, a place where everyone can just post their scores and so that people can look on, online uh, to see these scores. Yeah. We also uh, do an end of the year report, just as yeah, DOE okay. does, and yeah. um, supposedly that goes to the legislature as well. Okay. So, but but we can work with Amanda right? on getting that. Yeah, so we can see the assessment data. You, 
Senator, you're going to need to fund the, fund the console because they have zero funding. Oh, just take the since you didn't, you only got six thousand eighty-eight. Just take that uh, that money that if we can get you the six thousand five, just offset. Give them it. the difference. Yeah. Maybe you and, can and work then, that uh, way. What's just, or, or allow for the eight thousand plus, and then the yes, schools yes. will contribute to Hold the on. funding we, of we the council. We have to work with DOE also. Okay, we can't just. We're, I'm sure they're watching, and um, I was just sharing with. Um, my colleague to the left, I, I think we're going to have a, a, a meeting with Superintendent Fernandez. Uh, there, there's going to be a lot, of, I think, of discussion, obviously, moving forward. And I think the challenge for, for us as our, you know, I, I, I sit to the left and right of educational leaders. Uh, I come from the finance side of this operation. Um, but I do know that the one goal that Juan is speaking about is making sure our kids get educated. Yes. I need to know that they're going to write, they're going to add, and, you know, comprehend, because... Uh, that, that to me is a big challenge. I, I, there's one thing that I have not forgotten uh, that sh uh, Rachel shared with me. So we did the assessment at the beginning of the year and we tested all our kids and she came back and she said, we're having problems with some of these kids because they can't read or write. And I go, what are, what are you talking about? She goes, they came from a different school into our school system and they can't read or write. And this is a third grade. And I said, that makes no sense to me, right? I'm just saying, you know, and, and then I said, well, what school did they come from? Mm -mm. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, but I see the question I have is, is why is it that our school can't go back to that school as, as leaders and say, there seems to be a problem here. How do we fix it? Mm. Because you're, you're, I felt bad for that student that's going to be left behind. That, that's the true definition of a student that's left behind because they can't catch up with this. Mm -hmm. because they never got taught how to use this. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they couldn't read or write, Senator. Then they f that school failed from the beginning. And then they're transferring that student over to our school, who then our challenge is to get that student up to speed. So we have to divide our faculty and so forth. And that's what they tell me. I said, so how do I, as a educational leader, come back and say, hey, this is a public school student that needs to be helped. Mm -hmm. Can't just be pushing them around and, and shuffling them and say, now it's your turn to educate that kid. That's not fair to the, that, that's not fair to the student. And I think, you know, as, as we all sit here, I think the tragic part is, and I challenge you to do this, let's all get in the room and let's have a statewide assessment of our, our school system. Because at the end of the day, I want to know that you know, our kids can read and write. And, and again, you, you get a device like this, I, I hope they understand what they're doing because it, it's the device of the future. And if you don't embrace this, I don't want, you know, any of the 31,000 public school students to be left behind because that's not fair. Then we have failed here to give them the tools. So I think that's our, my, my, you know, pledge here is, to work with GDOE. I've been there, I know that. And, I, and I, you know, I, I think what we have to do collectively is, is divvy up the pot that, that's there and make it work what's best for all our students. Right, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I just I, wanted to, sorry, one thing about, um, it, it's, to, it's, I think, overly simplifying saying that, um, that this third grader, a, a teacher or a school had failed the third grader because there's just so many things that goes on and it's, it's not necessarily the school or the teacher. We have a lot of uh, GDO teachers who, who give 110% and so you know kudos to them and it's not to say that, it's just that perhaps one of the charter schools was a better fit and so the boy came to our school, there was it was a smaller setting. We were able to uh, fulfill something for him. Um, so, you know, it, um, there's just, even assessments, when you have a diverse schools, your number is not gonna be this stellar number. And so it's not to, we don't wanna like say GDO, it, it shouldn't be GDO versus charter. The purpose is to give these kids opportunity to choose our numbers of autistic kids have been growing because of the devices. <laughs> and so that's something we've been having to tackle. And, um, but the kids love the school and they're learning. And, and so I, I don't want it to leave being a GDOE versus charter. 
Um, we're, reason why it just comes across that way is because we kind of need to share our needs. And so, but yeah, so I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, yes, thank you for that. Because I was going to ask right before you spoke to, let's focus on the charter school and, and, <laughs> and you know, we don't need this kind of comparison. Yes, I understand, but DOE is not here at the table to also, I'm sure they, they're, they're explanations for a lot of the things. And so let's just, let's focus on the charter school. Let's, this is not about DOE. This is not charter versus DOE. This is, we're sticking to the charter school, okay? But, but sticking right. to oh, charter you. school, there are two things that, you know, it's, it's kind of running, getting late, but for accreditation, um, one of the obstacle that I learned had was, first of all, the criterion was after 120 days, we're supposed to engage with the accrediting um, organization and so forth. But we kind of jumped the gun and went last year and had an evaluation. And because we didn't have the third year data, we were granted candidacy as opposed to accreditation. And I think in the, the intent of the law is great. I, I think we should be accredited. But what we didn't realize, what there was another status. It's not just being accredited versus not being accredited. There's actually a candidacy status. And the candidacy status and initial accreditation actually has the same process. And where you're availed to training and, and working towards this um, thing. So what had happened was we gained a candidacy status last year. And when WASC realized that was going to hurt our ability to renew, they gave us special consideration to come back and for the purpose of helping us get that initial accreditation so that we can get renewed. Um, so that's one of the things that's out there. And the second thing is, ILEARN is now up in a position where we're nearing the um, time where we're supposed to turn in our um, renewal, um, renewal for charter, but the council currently is not in a position where they're able to um, get a quorum because of no lack of support. Um, so we're kind of heading towards a limbo area where there's no council that can convene to renew our charter. Wait, wait, where's your council at? Where's your council members? We have uh, Amanda um, Bloss who has been very supportive, constantly um, meeting, checking us on, on what we need and trying to push our, right, um, right. our interests but she's having difficulty right now convening her um, to form a quorum, and that was a big issue. So why don't you find people who can make quorum, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if they can make quorum, five. then just release those and find those that are committed to making quorum. Sure. They lost That's the several, standard. Uh, they lost several members, of course. Mr. Babalta yes. was appointed, and, uh, and then Mr. Yeah, yeah, Anki, you're but right. See, these There's are all within your control, so right? No, it's not no right. these that are appointed well, positions. Well, well, not like within your control, but you have the influence to, to get this, bo the council going. I mean, you know, so use your influence to get the council going. Senator, <laughs> I, I don't think we have that influence because the council is appointed by not by us. Yeah, I understand that. And so you I mean, do have that influence because you're stakeholders. We are, but uh, yeah. I believe so, if we put that so influence, rally that would together be together and ask the governor. <laughs> Senator, you have Speaker uh, Wampat so. here. You have <laughs> Mayor Tanya Tanya Tongo, for Senator Santos, Senator Manabusan. Senator, we did. We met with the governor yesterday, okay, and we good. did bring up about okay. the council that we do need the council. Okay, very good. Okay. Just as a point of information on this matter of GDOE and charter school, I want you to know that uh, in the previous administration, one of the special assistants came to me and insisted that the test results for GACs be released and comparisons with GDOE be made. And I had to remind him that nowhere in the law does it say that the charter schools have to compare themselves to GDOE that the charter law simply states that we must give the district-wide assessments and the reports all stay within the school. He insisted that I can't believe you don't want to release that to the public. I said, first of all, I have no say. The trustees and the trust and the law are the, are the individuals who are responsible for releasing this data. Mm -hmm. So the effort to compare is not coming from our side. Mm -hmm. It's coming on the other side. And I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. 
In fact, when we did the first report and the results were released, the media went wild. I mean, I was interviewed at the university and lights and everything. And then that's when the enrollment shot up to about 1,000, 1,000, some students. Because of that, parents want their kids to go to schools where they're going to be successful, not to compare with GDOE, because there really are a lot of good teachers. I've trained a lot of them uh, in the GDO system. Thank you, Dr. Sublime. And then Sifa, you want to talk a little bit about your assessments? Yes, so um, we're the new kids on the block. We don't really have um, a wide variety of our assessments, but we did um, give the BRIGAX uh, writing and spelling, um, as well as the RAT testing for math. Uh, we were just introduced to the equal shanker for reading. Um, so upon giving that in the beginning of the year, um, our data shows that um, sixth grade under the RAT testing, data indicates 37% of sixth graders are performing at the sixth grade level or higher. 28% of the students are performing one grade below, and 35% are performing at the third or fourth grade level. Um, for seventh grade, seventh grade for the RAT testing, um, data indicates 42% of 7th graders are performing at grade level or higher, 17% are performing at 6th grade level, and 41% are performing between the 5th and 3rd grade level. For 8th grade, 37% of our 8th graders are performing at the 11th or 12th grade level, 25% are performing at the seventh grade level, and 38% are performing between the sixth to fourth grade level. And that's for math. Um, for the Brigax um, spelling and writing, 59% uh, of the sixth graders are performing at the sixth grade level or higher in spelling. 11% are at the fifth grade level. 40% are performing between the fourth to second grade level. Please note that this is just the beginning. Um, we need a baseline, so as we go, I'm pretty sure our, our scores will go up. All right, thank, can we get a copy of that also? Um, yes, we'll go ahead and forward it to you. Okay, office. all right, thank you so much. And then Career Tech, I know we're, you're a conditional charter, so I think you had a... Um, all of our students have tested above the average grade level nationally. <laughs> All right. Um, did you want to do this presentation, or you're fine? We, or we could just take questions if you have any questions about it, but no. otherwise. Okay, no questions. Okay, well, I'd like to thank, is there anything else that you like to address? Otherwise, um, I, we covered accreditation, assessment. I was a little bit disappointed, though, that GAX didn't receive their accreditation, and then for the for the high school candidacy for K to five right, but for the, for the uh, higher school, grade levels right six to eight and unfortunately you know, it was based of, um, on our facility the yeah, situation that's why. In so which you're we fixing that had a substantive change in okay. having to move to a different facility uh, more so than really what um, the curriculum side of it so it'll be fixed. Yes, we're working. So we're all back now to one campus, you're right. And, okay. and as I stated earlier, as we're going through the self-study, okay. uh, is that we're bringing along our high school students as well, middle and high school students. We're not leaving them behind. Okay, very good. All right, so what, what I owe you is uh, to work with DOE and to address the May 1st enrollment to see if we can lift up the cap for the charter schools. But you know, and what you owe to the people is perhaps uh, getting a functioning council, right? <laughs> I know you're looking at me like this, like it's not our call, but really I think you have the influence to... Uh, All due respect, Senator, we've tried. I mean, I, I, I've offered that, you know, we amend the law and allow that a designated representatives from each of the approved charter schools sit on the council. Mm -hmm. and, and that way we, we don't have a quorum issue, I think, we, we, with all the professionals up here, when it comes to our charter school, we sit there and nod and just, and just watch the process. I think there's a certain degree of professionalism that we all have to 
exhibit and given the fact that I, I think in this day and age there's there's just not too many people wanting to be on government boards anymore. I mean that's the that's the yes, truth. I understand that. And they're not standing in line to to want to be on a board or you know given given the uh, the the challenges that are there. I mean this is a very simple board to be on, but obviously there, there's just not the uh, you know they're not out there. And and again um, we've tried to get names, and you know the the common word is. Do, do I have to go before the legislature? And they said, hmm, you know, and I, I can't lie to my friends. So, yeah, that, that yeah. certainly is a challenge. But okay. I think with respect to um, the, a quick amendment is, again, allow, you know, the designee from each of the schools to sit on the, the council themselves and expand the number to make it fit. That's mm -hmm. our recommendation. Okay. We will look into that. Yeah. I'll research that. <laughs> All right, and um, and we're still working on a separate uh, part, a separate provision in the budgetary bill law. Thank you, all of you, for coming you here, much. spending your time. It is now. Uh, thank you. It is now 6:08 p.m. The committee on education, air transportation, and statistics and research planning is adjourned. Thank you very much.